Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. And welcome to today's DevOps program brought to you, brought to you by TechStrong, AWS, and PagerDuty. We've got an exciting panel ahead, but before we begin, I have a few housekeeping notes. Today's event is being recorded, so if you miss any of our discussion and would like to uh, rewatch it, you will be able to do that by watching the on-demand version, the recording. It'll all be sent to you in an email uh, once the program is over. You'll also be able to share it with your friends as well. If you have any questions, we'd like you to submit your questions at any time using the Q&A tab on the right side of your screen. You'll also find the chat tab uh, right next to the question section. We want to engage with you. Uh, let us know where you're from, engage with your fellow audience members, talk to our uh, presenters for today. We will have a few polls here in just a minute. Um, so go ahead and just answer those. Let us know your thoughts on those. And finally, at the conclusion of today's program, We'll be giving away four $25 Amazon gift cards, so be sure to stick around. Let's go ahead and kick off today's topic and get started with the polls with humans, robots, and incident responses. Shortly after this, I will turn the time over to our moderator, Kat Gaines, and the rest of today's panel. So let's go ahead and start our first poll. these coming in. I can see some more results coming. There's still a few more to go. There we go. All right, I'm going to close this poll. We've got one more. So how are your incident responses, response call structured? Well, oiled machine, everyone knows their part. Some structure, we have some roles defined, but there are gray areas that occasionally cause confusion, chaos. We don't have defined roles or structured calls, just consists of figuring out the next steps. All right. All right, we've got some great engagement here from all of you. We're going to go ahead and close this poll, and I'm going to turn it back over to uh, Kat Gaines to go ahead and get this started. Uh, Kat, if you want to take it away from here. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Jared. So welcome again, everyone, to Humans, Robots, and Incident Response. Thanks for taking our polls. As Jared mentioned, I'm Kat Gaines. I'm a developer advocate at PagerDuty, and I'll be your moderator today. Joining me, I have Paula Thrasher, who is Senior Director of Engineering Infrastructure at PagerDuty, and Julie Gunderson, a Senior Developer Advocate at AWS. Um, please also make sure to enter your Q&A in the Q&A boxes during the conversation. We'll leave a few minutes at the end to answer that. So if we had to guess, those polls gave us some interesting insight. But if we had to guess how many of our listeners here have at any point recently gathered with their teams in person to troubleshoot an incident, we put those numbers pretty low, maybe even zero. And really, we're in the era of cloud-based remote work, and the extra emphasis on that fact over the last couple of years has really impacted how we all collaborate. So no matter how you answered the polls, doing a review of procedures frequently is really a must, especially if your teams are distributed. Your products, your infrastructure, your team structures, your tooling, those things are all going to change, and your procedures have to keep up with it. You can't retain customer trust if your procedures, for example, for responding to an incident 
don't reflect what's happening internally. And we've all felt some kind of shift of where how we get things done in the last several years. So for many of us, that shift has been felt the most in our procedures where teams and systems have to work together quickly to avoid catastrophe. So what we're going to do today is we're going to dig in. We're going to discuss how we can make incident response easier on everyone in high stress moments. And Julie, I'd love to start with a couple of topics that I know you can share a lot of information with our audience about. So the first is really setting the stage for us on what we all mean by incident response, why that's important. And the second is kind of digging deeper into that with the idea of operational excellence, which is something I know AWS has really well defined. Julie, you are muted. Yep. So, you know, <laughs> great way to start a webinar, but actually yeah, a really know. good example of what the world has changed to now that we're in remote teams um, all over the world. You know, we're not necessarily in the same room, um, but thanks for all of that, Kat. I'm excited to be here today. For those of you that don't know, I actually uh, were also worked at PagerDuty. Um, and so incident response is a topic that's close to my heart, but I kind of want to start by level setting today. So I'm not sure of how many of you might remember. Uh, I think it was back in 2017, there was this, this big internet phenomenon and discussion around a dress and whether or not people saw this, this dress as a gold and white dress or a black and blue dress. And if you don't remember this, definitely just Google it. Um, it got everybody talking and there were all these conversations and arguments about what color is this dress. The reason that I bring that up is it's important to have a definition of what something is for your team because you can spend, I think there's still arguments going on actually about what color the actual dress is. You can spend a lot of time arguing about the meaning of something or what something looks like. So I always love starting with a definition of what an incident is. So the definition that you see here comes from the NIST glossary uh, for the word incident. And look, there's other definitions. So whether or not you call an incident an unplanned service interruption, an incident or dumpster fire, whatever it is, have a definition. And I want to focus a little bit now on the larger portion of this definition, which the definition is an occurrence that actually or imminently jeopardizes the confidentiality, integrity, or availability of information or an information system. And I would add something that is customer impacting. But let's look at the imminently jeopardizes. So Kat, can you go on to the next slide really quickly? In today's world, creating technology solutions, it's a lot like constructing a physical building, right? If the foundation isn't solid on your physical building, it could cause structural problems. It can undermine the integrity and function of the building. It can make the building unlivable. It can actually lead to, to injury. And what we want to do is when we talk about building our technology systems, we want to have a solid foundation. So at AWS, we talk about the well-architected framework and what you see here are the pillars of the AWS well-architected framework. And the framework is a design of principles across six pillars. And there's also a set of questions that you can find in your console to help walk you through this. Ultimately, if you neglect any of these six pillars, which when you look at, you know, security, reliability, performance, efficiency, cost optimization, operational excellence, and sustainability. If you ignore those when architecting technology solutions, it can be a challenge to build a system that delivers those functional requirements that not only meet your expectations, but that meet your customers' expectations. And so it's important to incorporate these pillars because it helps you produce the stable and efficient systems that then allow you to focus on those functional requirements. And so as Kat mentioned, I wanna talk just briefly about the operational excellence pillar. So operational excellence is the first of the six pillars and it was introduced into the framework in 2016 because customers needed help with people, processes, and the mechanism side of their workloads, right? So it's really the ability to run and monitor systems to deliver business value and continually improve supporting processes and procedures. And that's what we are really talking about. 
running and monitoring systems so that we can deliver that business value. And we're always looking to continually improve because that's what our customers demand. Our customers expect uptime from us. They may not say that they, you know, expect a certain number of nines because those aren't the words that they use, but it's what our customers expect. They expect to be able to use our tools um, to their benefit. So Kat, next slide. We have to start somewhere. So whether or not it's two months ago or today, this problem, it really sums it up nicely. It's never too late. And we've seen it again and again. You know, Paula, I think we saw it a bit when I was at Patriot Duty. Customers would get a little bit scared. Well, oh, I don't have all these mechanisms in place, so therefore I'm just going to hide and not deal with it. Unfortunately, that doesn't really work. And so it's okay if you don't have everything that we're talking about today. That's why you're here, so that you can learn about these uh, best practices. And we've got resources to follow up on. So why is this important? Well, good outcomes usually start with good planning and preparation. You know, it's definitely not something we want to leave to luck. You know, we also don't want to start planning our incident response process when we're in the middle of a sub one on Black Friday and people cannot order their black and blue dress because that's what I see. It's black and blue, by the way. So the first step here is really to have a plan. And we're going to talk about that. And Paula's going to go a little bit more into depth in this as well. But having an effective incident response plan, it confers real financial, reputational, regulatory and operational benefit upon your organization. Because there are challenges with distributed systems. And we're gonna talk about that on the next slide, Kat. Look, our systems are complex. You know, distributed systems have multiple components located on different machines and they vary greatly in implementation. And those are our technical systems. So also let's look at our human systems because our human systems now have multiple components if we're the people located on different machines if we're the locations. Just look in the chat at where people are from. And we do very greatly in implementation in our backgrounds, where we are, the cultures of where we are, how we communicate different laws uh, that regulate um, requirements for on call, for example. So these are all things that we want to think about and plan for when we're discussing incident response. You know, as distributed technical systems grow in complexity, you know, so does the difficulty in predicting failures, right? We know that our systems are going to fail. It's not an if, it is a when, but it also becomes difficult to predict those. And there are traditional methods of testing known conditions, um, that we can look at, but testing isn't always sufficient. You know, failures of mission critical distributed systems, these can cause costly outages. And oftentimes that cost comes from the amount of time it takes from that failure to remediate that failure. Um, so MTTR, mean time to restoration, that's one of the things that we want to look at. And where can we reduce the cost of these outages? So in a survey in 2017, 98% of organizations, they actually said that a single hour of downtime could cost their business over $100,000. And there was a very costly outage um, for an airline um, that had a failure in uh, 2017 that not only stranded tens of thousands of passengers, but it also cost the company over 80 million pounds or 102 million US dollars. So companies need solutions to these challenges because waiting for the next costly outage isn't an option. We know that there are going to be incidents. So let's talk about how we can reduce the impact of those, not only to the cost, to the bottom, to the dollar amount, but to our teams and what they suffer from burnout and to our customers for frustration, to our public reputation. Um, so part of that comes with planning and preparation. Kat, if you can move to the next slide. So we started out by defining the incident you're addressing. Let's just get everybody on the same page, right? Because you need to define that and then you can go ahead and define the responses. This is going to be a big part of your success. You know, of all the things that could go horribly wrong, 
what actually will. And the fact is, you don't know. I don't know. Um, but you do need to kind of enumerate a risk, a list of like real risk to your business and services you provide to your customer so that you can have those preventative and responsive measures uh, in place to take instead of taking that reactive stance. You know, and some customers, they, they take full blown like risk assessments that informs their thinking about risk mitigation and how that plays into incident response. Others use threat modeling to think about threats that could impact, you know, applications. Um, or how that plays into incident response scenarios and considering how, you know, vulnerabilities might come together to create risk. Others map out risks with informal processes similar to risk assessments. But ultimately, once you've defined that incident, then you need to map out how you will respond to it. And part of that defining the incident stage is do you have metrics? Do you know how your workloads are performing? Are they misbehaving? Are they being bad little workloads? And can you tell if they have, you know, run off to a party in the middle of the night? How are you monitoring those? How do you measure those? How do you know if a workload is misbehaving? And better yet, is your system telling you that a workload is misbehaving? Or are you finding out about it because your customers are telling you? And ideally, you want to get in front of that where your systems are telling you where maybe your customers don't really even notice that there's a blip. Um, so how do we do that? Well, do your teams get the appropriate alerts? Have you tested these processes? Again, that goes back to the preparation, which then leads to planning and practice and you learn from that and refine it. And Kat asked some great polls, right? Like how often do you refine that or go back and look at your incident response process? That's something to look at. You know, are you refining that and learning from it? And we've got all of these different operating models now, you know, where we're distributed or we're in offices. And Paula, you know, why don't you talk to us about that? But before we get to you, Kat, I think there's a poll here that, that we can run. Yeah, we have a couple more questions we're going to throw up for everyone just to give you a moment or two to give us a little more insight around kind of where you are, um, what you're running. So this first one is how many of you run a traditional operation? We'll give you a moment or two to respond to that one. And then we'll cue the second one up in just a couple minutes here. Okay, I'm seeing some responses come in. It looks like most of us don't, but a good number of us still do. And we can go ahead and queue up our second poll, I think. It's coming in just a moment, folks. Okay, so this one, how often do you review your alerts and alerting? We just wanna get a little bit of insight into how often you're looking at this, how often you're looking at how this is set up, what it looks like, and to a lot of what Julie just talked about and what Paul is gonna speak about, just understanding kind of where you are there. Okay seeing some pretty overwhelming response for as needed. Uh, so when something goes wrong, we're looking at our setup, trying to understand where we need to change things around. So with that, Paula, why don't we head to some more insight you have in this area? Yeah, thanks. Um, so if we kind of scroll back to the uh, slides, um, the traditional operating center, uh, you know, I go back to when I started uh, you know, in the industry, I, I worked in an operating center. It looked straight out of the movies. It had a tiered, uh, you know, set of chairs. It had big monitors. There was a glass wall and next to it were a bunch of servers right on the other side. Uh, and there's certainly a lot of places and they're still running some form of that traditional operating center. Uh, and one of the things out of that operating center that I think has transformed, especially as we become even more virtual distributed global companies, especially um, is that um, a lot of times we have this like tier one, we have somebody in the operating center who's staring at a pane of glass looking for an issue and they do what I call the phone operator job. They see an issue, 
they sort of like go, ah, that goes to this team and they, you know, alert that team, you know, directly, right? So that traditional operating system system is actually the, the manual process of that tier one alerting people to problems. Um, so that's certainly one of, I think, the first places to start an automation journey is, uh, you know, to everything Julie was just saying about the complexity of systems that we run, um, especially when there's no glass wall, right? You're not going to see the red light on the server. Uh, so, you know, you don't need somebody staring down the server aisle. Uh, what you need is to take that automation and make sure that's actually driving, um, you know, triggering the incident uh, or even just there's a little bit of noise reduction going on there too, right? That it's not overly, you know, paging you at 2 a.m. That's the other issue. Um, so I think rethinking about that model about what the, like I, you know, as we talked about this, what are the robots doing in this process and what are the humans doing, right? And so um, if you'll go to the next slide, I want to talk a little bit about kind of that evolution of how you can think about automating um, and what role automation plays and thinking about the process that you currently have around incident response. And I think of this as this is a bit of a hierarchy and you're, you're probably on a journey um, somewhere on this hierarchy to get to this level of maturity. Um, and as you go through that, I think it's really important to think about what are the humans doing during this process? What is the computer or the robots doing? And by that, what I mean is there's one thing that humans still do really well, which is make decisions in the face of ambiguity. When there is not an obvious yes or no answer, humans are really especially expert humans who know the system are really good decision makers. It's really hard, um, even you know, the world of self-driving cars and uh, uh, speaking assistants and other things, it's still really hard to replicate human brain. But what do computers do? Well, they do rapid calculations and they do things that follow rules and heuristics. So the first example I gave, if that monitoring software doesn't automatically alert and generate uh, you know, the right people in the room and create the incident and, and automate, that's an easy first because that's a heuristic. It doesn't need it. It's not ambiguous. You have an issue, right? Um, if you still have other humans, maybe your customer is telling you, you are having a business system issue. You're letting a human do something you really need a machine to do. Um, the first thing from maturity at the very bottom of this is start getting your metrics, your health, how's it going, logs, automate that first, right? Um, go from any level of manual to that. The first thing you need to be able to do for a good incident response is know when you're in a failure state, know when you are not doing good. And if you run a sufficiently complicated system, and I'm sure most of you do, because uh, if it does anything other than hello world, it's probably complicated. Uh, it, it's basically, it's in failure all the time. There's probably errors in your system all the time. That's probably, you know, every aspect of the system is not performing amazing all the time. It is in failure and it's how you're responding to that and the next level of automation that helps you kind of get a good response together. So, okay, we found out that we have a problem. <laughs> now we've got some humans in the loop. We've brought them in, we've maybe called an incident. The next level of maturity is thinking about, okay, how do we orient the humans to the problem that the computer is seeing? So usually this is done through diagnostics, right? What happens? You get on an incident call. Um, you know, I've been on many throughout my career. The first thing you do, what's going on, <laughs> right? What's happening? <laughs> and you're looking at a lot of things, right? You're looking at what changed. You're looking at what's in an error state, what kind of an error state, um, you know, what systems look healthy. So you're, you're running some diagnostics on your system, trying to get a better picture of what's actually happening. Right. And that, that can be fully automated as well. Right. So the next part is to have those run books. Um, you know, you can get the humans on the call to run the run books, uh, even better if you could just automatically provide that context, right. As that incident calls kicking off. Right. So that's kind of the next layer of maturity. So we've, we found out what's going on. Now we can automate some diagnostics. Now we can start talking about this like more nirvana like space of, okay, now we can actually start remediating things potentially automatically. And I think the safest place to get to this next level of maturity is a lot of times teams have, you know, a classic example might be, uh, you know, database cache fills up or something. And if this happens, we run this run book and it clears the cache and a responder, this is already written, it's already tested, we know how this works. Another example is a restart. 
or a rollback. If this happens, here's the rollback script, right? These are scripts that we already have, hopefully in our organization. Uh, and if you've got it and you're testing it, now I've got these run books that I'm safe. You know, I, I've, I've detected, I've diagnosed, and I feel like this is a safe action to take. So I can start to get that thing. And as you get, a, you know, as you get better at these things, you can get to more and more automated resolutions. So you can start to prevent incidents before they get to. Um, but, you know, kind of assessing where each of you is on this chart kind of should tell you what the next thing on the ladder um, to work on to get even better um, in a maturity model. Um, so, okay, if you'll go to the next slide, um, I want to talk uh, a little bit, of course, about sort of this in a cloud context um, as well. Uh, you know, there's a lot of Amazon uh, tools and toolkit there. Um, PSG and Amazon have some great integrations. Uh, you may be using other services. You may have a hybrid. A lot of organizations have both. Uh, but Amazon already has quite a bit of native things around what I was just talking about, both the diagnostic side as well as the just basic monitoring. Uh, and even things maybe that, um, you know, go beyond availability. Uh, it could be that maybe you want to alert when you've got a policy violation from a security standpoint or when, uh, even from a cost management standpoint, maybe when a system is exceeding a cost threshold, it's, um, it's starting to consume a lot and you want to tell somebody, hey, um, this is not in bounds. So there's a lot of use cases that go just beyond availability that you might want to alert and get that human in the loop and start responding. Uh, but just want to mention that, you know, from a sort of product orchestration, we've, we've got a lot of this, you know, available right now and can really help accelerate some of the stuff along this journey if you've got that. Um, whether that be from the very beginning of the incident, just, you know, call somebody on the phone all the way to, you know, automating various aspects of the run book um, and the alert piece. Um, so, Kathy, go to the next slide. And... I kind of think about this as this is, you know, when you're running an incident, uh, usually if you have an incident, I'm assuming it's because you have a customer impact. Um, you know, maybe you've caught it before you have a customer impact, but most of the time, the reason you called it an incident is that it's somehow impacting a customer or some other downstream system, right? And so, as we talked about, you know, the first piece you have to know is you have to know you're in a failure state, right? And then we want to get the humans in the loop. That mobilization piece of like getting the right people in again moving from what i call that traditional operating center where you go from the like phone operator calls people like let's automatically call people <laughs> and let's call the right people let's call the people who's you know if the database is the one that throw the error call the database team if it's a network issue call the network team if this service is down call that service team don't just like spam the world um which is not helpful in an incident response just to have you know lots of people going what's going on right yeah so you're only involving the people that their system is you know implicated so far um that gets a little tricky because sometimes an upstream system uh sees the alert first and it's actually a downstream system that's having the issue but over time you can start to evolve the maturity to get the right team in right and then when you have that team in you know, they may have their own run books, but the more you can help automate, and, and even one of the things that we have that I think is really powerful, if you're still in that tier one, uh, and especially if you're running something 24 seven, you've got somebody whose job it is to be awake at 2 a.m. You don't want to wake somebody up, at least I certainly don't want to be woken up at 2 a.m. You can empower that team with an automated run book to run the diagnostics. So at least they don't wake up people they don't need to wake up at 2 a.m. Um, and then if you feel really, you know, sporty and confident about your automation, you can have them actually run the resolution. Uh, like I said, the, the safest example for me is always like a rollback or, you know, thing like that. That's usually something that we have really well oiled run books around. And that's something that um, most, most organizations can like set that North star and get to that level of maturity of these, you know, subset of really basic issues. We can implement some automated resolutions and feel confident in that without having to like, you know, do amazing amounts of sophisticated, um, and you'll have a huge impact, right? The impact of automating this is fundamentally just significantly less mean time to resolve. Um, you know, we've seen 40% even higher reductions in mean time to resolve, mean time to detect, mean time to resolve an incident by implementing the automation and, and the robots throughout this life cycle. Um, and then the other bonus, of course, of doing automation is that it, it generates a lot of data that you can learn, use to learn about your incidents 
understand, you know, I think a lot of you look like, you know, you look at whether alerting is an issue um, when it is implicated in an incident, is my guess. <laughs> then you start to look at your alerting, um, you know, and then you can get more preventative. Uh, it also can give, we use something we do internally, we do uh, uh, a monthly and a quarterly sort of macro view of all things, you know, from high severity to low, just, you know, where was alerting, where, where did we miss things? what are patterns, what are trends. So if you're not already doing something like a meta review of incidents, um, having access to this really rich data and kind of looking into the meta analysis can give you some trends because it may not be alerting. That's your problem. Alerting may be fine. Uh, it may be the getting the right people on the call is the issue. It may be the remediation takes a long time. Maybe rollbacks are long. Maybe the remediation is bad. Maybe there's a particular component that's causing a lot of incidents. Um, that needs some investment in reliability. So even beyond the benefits of just the automation itself, I think is the data that it gives off, you know, throughout that process. So um, just to sort of bring that back to, you know, our theme, I really think, um, you know, as I, I own a site reliability engineering organization within PagerDuty, and, you know, I, I like to think about this as it's very much, a, a combination of making the people successful, enabling the humans that are part of this response, um, you know, to be able to do this effectively, also have kind of a balanced life. On-call is tough. I've done it for the majority of my career. Um, it's, it's a little brutal out there sometimes, right? So thinking about how you manage your humans. Um, managing, you know, the system gives you the right signal so you can really get you know, the right data from all of your different tools and telemetry, and that you bound it in a really good, uh, you know, process that kind of supports both the robots and the humans. Um, so with that, I'm going to uh, hand it back to you, uh, Kat, we're going to talk a little more. Yeah, I think that uh, you made a really good note, Paul, just now about managing your humans. And we've talked a little bit about humans in this. We've talked about the robots aspect. We've talked about incident response, obviously. Um, let's dig in a little bit more to the human side with both of you. So when it, you're talking about managing humans and how they play in, part of that is communication, both internal communication as everyone's trying to just kind of corral what's going on, and then the external communication where you have a reputation on the line. You have trust with your customers. You have the ability to show empathy for them. You have the ability to reinforce their trust in you. Um, can both of you just talk a little bit about the best ways to go about that and really a little bit about how it fits into everything else we've been discussing? Yeah, I, I, so I'll share that we, um, you know, uh, earlier this year, we had noticed a pattern, I mentioned the meta reviews, that we were having, a, a, we weren't doing a really good job on communicating out of incidents. And, um, you know, didn't immediately assume that like, you know, the humans, you know, you, you screwed up, why weren't you communicating? Um, it turns out it's hard and I'll, I'll give an anecdote. Um, there was an air crash, I, I think the year was 1997. I guess we've got a big um, aerospace theme here, <laughs> not intentionally so, <laughs> uh, but I did used to work uh, a little bit in the aviation industry. So I've got a little background there. So there was a crash where basically the pilots were so busy communicating, they, they literally crashed the airplane. And uh, a lot of folks can be familiar that the uh, U.S. Uh, FAA Safety Board does a major review after you know aerospace crashes to, from a safety standpoint. And one of the practices that they came up after that incident was this principle of you know aviate, navigate, communicate. And the idea is the first thing you need to do when the airplane is malfunctioning is fly the airplane, right? <laughs> and then you know navigate this thing to a safe place and now it's okay to communicate. And the reason, uh, you know, communication is a really high order uh, brain activity and problem solving is another really high order brain activity. And it's really hard for any human to do both. It's almost impossible. And so we were like, whoa, we, got, we have to figure out, you know, we have incidents, we need to solve the incident. That's what we were doing. That was the right answer which was solve the problem first. But as a, you know, for us, anyone else as a customer service organization, communication is a really important aspect of trust too. So we can't solve it and not communicate it. How do we do both? So we came up with a couple of um, 
ideas. And I, I think if, uh, you know, they're actually, um, we've, we have a public uh, response.pagerduty.com we've open sourced. Um, so these very ideas that we put in place internally are actually out there externally. Um, you're welcome to use them and because they are open source, you can even make them part of your own policy. And so one of the things we described was first that there's an external communication role. There is somebody whose job it is on that incident call to be the communicator. Uh, and I think having that role, if you don't have it already, um, and it may be something that you only call in if it's a customer facing incident, but having that there gives somebody the responsibility to communicate. But even that person's got a lot going on, right? Uh, and the responders, you know, trying to sort of draft that communication while things are on fire, uh, you know, Black Friday <laughs> and you can't buy your dress is a tough act too. So the other aspect that we added was templates. Um, look, you know, uh, writing, uh, this is great for a lot of reasons. One is we have people who, you know, the language of our business is English, but not everybody speaks English natively. Uh, so that's, you know, that's a challenge that we were trying to overcome. And secondly, we had certain things we wanted to make sure we say, what is the impact? How long is this going on? Is there a workaround? What, you know, regions or areas is it affecting? Is it all the way down or just like a little bit, and, you know, various things. And aspects of that were getting left off. So by having this template, it's uh, it's like fill in the blank. You know, it's impacting this region. It's this feature. It's you know some all many. Right? So having that template made it a lot easier for that person tasked with communication to be able to fill in and put out a high quality. The other benefit for organizations, and I know there are plenty out there that require sign off on communications before they go public, is that because we had the templates, you know, that, that takes away the absence of, is this okay to post publicly, right? It, it, it makes it safe for the humans to feel like it's okay to post this because this is pre-approved, right? Um, so even if you don't have that kind of culture, uh, it just takes the temperature down for everybody in that call. They know this is an okay thing. Uh, and we've even templated, you know, just the like, hey, we're looking at a problem, right? So that we've got a really quick, you know, before we know what's going on, we can at least acknowledge quickly that we know there is something, we are working on it. And that gives a trust signal uh, to customers to say, hey, we know that something's going on, we'll tell you more, and we commit to how long we're gonna uh, share that. And, and all of that guidance, as I mentioned, uh, is available. And if that's part of your process that could, uh, folks mentioned some aspects of chaos of their process. If that's part of your process that's currently a little chaotic, um, definitely can take a look at that and uh, feel free to use that in your organizations. And, you know, I want to just double down on how important that communication piece is because part of the cost of incidents, right, can be to reputation. It can be to brand. And you right. don't want your customers turning to social media or turning to Twitter to see if there is an incident um, because you are not telling them there is something. And Paula, that's one of the things that I love too, is just, you know what, set a regular cadence. We'll have an update every X number of minutes. And even if your update is no update, right? If your update is that's we're right. still investigating, that will also reduce the amount of calls to your support team because yeah, you've absolutely. acknowledged it. And, and that's yeah. another costly part of an incident is, is the people people time. Yeah. And, uh, it, it absolutely does have an impact on support, right? So the earlier you get it out, you cut off, you know, you don't cut off, but you, you basically communicate out the support people automated, you know, response to this thing. They're not dealing with a flood of what's going on, right? And the other thing about that is that the support organization now, you know, you think about the person on the other end, I've been on the other end, uh, you know, I've got an outage of a vendor, uh, you know, again, this, this happens, you know, all of us, we run in this interconnected ecosystem. <laughs> I'm accountable to my own system, both do I need to take an action? Is this a long thing or a short thing? But also, when am I going to know what's going on? Uh, you know, I can remember, especially, uh, you know, years of like network outages and I'm like, I'm in a failure state. How long is it going to be till it goes back? And being like, I just want to know what's going on. <laughs> so think about that, you know, and usually that person that wants to know what's going on is a decision maker, is a is an important like they're responsible for, you know, they are on the other end consuming your service. They are probably a buyer of your service or at least a power user, and they really want to know what's going on. Um, so think about the importance about how you are supporting your customers in that context um, and your most important ones, you know, at that. 
Absolutely. Um, and I think that that kind of goes, I think we're going to probably maybe hopefully talk about this a little bit later about who you have in your, your incident response call. But um, one of the things that, that I always used to talk about is having somebody, you know, somebody from the support team can be a really great person that's writing um, some of that communication because they're really used to uh, that external customer facing communication. But again, I love your templates because you're right, higher order thinking at two o'clock in the morning, you've just woken up, everything's on fire. What can we do to reduce the stress um, on everybody from our, our responders to our customers, to our support teams? Yeah. yeah, I think you both kind of hinted at it a little bit. Why don't we talk about that, the rules that different people have in incident response. So you both mentioned support, for example, and just kind of the calm that it can introduce to their organization when they have these templates, they have this information readily available to them. Um, I'm thinking they could probably even play a role like customer liaison, not giving anything away here, but that might be a good thing for that team to do in an incident call. But what about other roles? What's important and what do, who do we need to make sure to include and just make sure the process is flowing? Well, if I can just start by, by sharing, Paula, and I want to, with some of the things that I've seen uh, in the past are incident calls where the entire company gets on the call. Mm -hmm. You know, you've got your Zoom screen with literally the maximum amount of little squares. And that uh, is really chaotic. And, you know, with different roles, what, what roles, Paula? Yeah, I will tell you the only thing that's more chaotic than a Zoom call with 50 screens is a phone call only with that many screens. Oh, yeah. We had video calls, even more chaotic. Uh, I have, I will tell you that I've been in a variety of different uh, incident management organizations all the way, um, you know, from military background uh, to, you know, commercial. And the ones that go better always have some role, major incident commander, incident commander, whatever it is. They got, a, they got a commander. They have somebody who is a decision maker and a traffic cop. Whatever you call that role, uh, I think the most common term is incident commander. It is, I assure you, the make or break role that will help calm the chaos uh, in your overall incident process. And the reason is, regardless of whether your calls currently have 50 people, 100 people, or 10, you need to have like a quarterback. You need to have somebody that sees the entire field of play, is calling the shots, is, you know, hey, investigate this. We're gonna investigate, we're gonna go, we're not gonna go. Because otherwise what happens, and I've been there when it's not, when this role isn't there, is that it's like, I mean, we've all been in committees, right? Committees cannot make decisions. <laughs> <laughs> it's the worst decision making place ever with lots of people and everybody is like, but I think we should do this. It helps to just have somebody in that role. And there's a lot of get different ways to do that. Uh, that's actually a use case. Some people that are in a traditional um, that make that transition from a traditional op center to more service ownership. The first thing they do is actually put their tier one in charge of incident command. They don't already do that. Um, that's one good way to get there um, with the people you've already got. Um, train that cohort in incident command. Uh, there's a lot of training out there. We've got that with PagerDuty. Um, I actually once upon a time went through um, FEMA, has a very similar process, and I went through what FEMA's incident training uh, is as well. And it has the same, you know, it's the same idea, right? It's it's really common against anybody that's really doing, you know, <laughs> disaster recovery, whether that's IT or hurricanes. <laughs> so, yeah, I I 100% I agree with that. I mean. Just to, to be fair, I think I've delivered that that page of duty incident response training a time or two. But once I learned it, actually, before coming to page of duty, it wasn't necessarily something I practiced. And once I learned it, it completely changed um, how I viewed incidents, and actually how I advised people to, to talk to incidents. But you're right. Having that commander, having that, that person to just point to um, can reduce the stress and confusion so much. And Confusion leads to delayed times to resolution. People arguing over each other or death by indecision. I mean, like I said, people are still arguing over the color of the dress. So that is that, if that argument doesn't get resolved by somebody in charge who can just say, let's move on um, yeah. to the next thing, then, then you can spend a lot of time just with indecision. Yeah. And then... And, and then I the next, you know, the next piece is obviously then the responders, right? So, you know, do you have responders from the team? Um, but the other piece that the incident commander can do is to dismiss people from the call. It does not appear to be a DNS issue. Let's get network off the call. It's never DNS, uh, except for when it is. But, <laughs> right? <laughs> we always page the network team. It's always on the database team, right? Those are the two teams that always get called. Um, and it's never their fault. Uh, that's not always true. But... Uh, right. So those are examples, too, is that, that getting people off your call is sometimes as important as getting them on your call. 
uh, and to make sure you've got a good process for, you know, like that's a big important piece of that as well is, you know, managing who's responding and who isn't responding, um, you know, back to sort of keeping those humans. So. Yeah. Absolutely. And and keeping people maybe who are even disruptive out of the call too, which is an entire conversation, or you can look at response.pagerduty.com for some of the resources yeah. and recommendations on just how to make those calls less chaotic. Um, one of the roles, my very first role when I learned about incident response, the first uh, call that I was on at Pager Duty, I actually took the role of scribe. Um, okay. And that role, I absolutely love for multiple reasons. Uh, because, well, first of all, Paula, why don't you tell us what the scribe is? Yeah, so the idea behind the scribe is I think it's sort of the court stenographer role or, you know, it's basically to take the notes of what's happening in the call, not word for word, but the key items that are happening. Um, you know, some teams might do that in their chat channel. Some teams do it separately. Uh, but I see like there was a question about how often do you have to review things to get benefit from the post incident phase. That's an important kind of piece of like putting together the history of what happened afterwards, kind of getting that context. Uh, and in that role, uh, you know, you don't always have it, but it's really valuable for that after. It's not it, it's not as much valuable in the incident. I mean, it kind of is. Uh, it's valuable if people join the call late. Yeah. It's especially valuable afterwards when you're trying to do this incident review process and, and and assess after the fact, you know, put some context on what happened. When did you know what? What actions were you taking? What context were those actions happening in? Yeah, and I agree, too, with the with the people who are either maybe you're bringing somebody new into the call. Maybe you're transitioning that incident commander role out because it's been a five hour incident and Paul is ready to um right. No, follow yeah, that's a <laughs> so those, those notes do serve as that historical here's what we've done here's where we right. are here's what we've investigated here's who's working on what so i know sometimes you know, join those incident calls high priority incident and everybody's silent and sometimes people are like well who's is, is anybody working on something yes and you can actually look through those notes to see that you know right now um cat is off doing x and investigating this and paul is working on this so i think that um it can be helpful during the incident. And just like you pointed out, and especially uh, afterwards in learning. Yeah. And, and then so then the other role I'll say on the call is actually the role after the call, uh, which is that we always assign someone to be responsible for the incident review after the call. Uh, and I think that that's a really important practice. And so I, I noticed there's a question in there about, you know, how often do you have to do this to sort of get value? Um, once. <laughs> but uh, I, really what I mean by that is if you really build a good culture around incident review and that you really take it seriously and you do it with an open mindset and not a like, who are we going to blame? You know, whose fault is it? Who's you know going to get fired for this one? If you do it for like what happened and really dig into why, why didn't we know that? Why did we do this? It, you know, what, why didn't our alerting catch it? Or why did our alerting catch it, but it was the wrong part of the system or, you know, whatever you're going to find out of that thing. The more you do that, the stronger you're going to build your system. And if you take ownership, uh, giving somebody who was on the call, owning, making sure that happens, then you start to create a culture of that incident review being an important part of the incident call, even though it actually happens afterwards. Right. And then that, uh, yeah. it's like this virtuous cycle that you're going to get better about your incident response and, you know, get out of, I look at it annually <laughs> to I'm constantly, you know, yeah. making it better. Right. Well, and if you think about it too, like incidents are a way for our systems to talk to us. That's, so it's unplanned. <laughs> yeah, it's un unplanned communication, but let's learn from that. And we don't want to waste the value that can come out of an incident um, and how we can make our systems more resilient in the future, you know, and our people. And, and that was one of the things that I, I love. We always viewed, reviewed not just the incident itself and the technicalities of it, but how did the whole response process work? And that goes back to, did our alerts work? Did the right people, did the right mm -hmm. people get paged? Did the escalations work? Um, all of that. Did our, did our monitoring pick up the right uh, signals? And um, that that just goes directly to the question of, of how often do you need to review these experiences? And also, Paula, I think the benefit of that, you said, you know, if you've got the right culture, and I think that one of the, the best things that can come out of this is also part of 
creating that culture. Because when other people join these calls or observe these calls or when incident reports are sent out and you can truly see that the organization learned from it and that we're not blaming anybody specifically and that Paula still works here, even though she's the one that clearly took down the system. I'm just- I'm <laughs> I totally that. Yeah. yeah. So we don't, we really don't- <laughs> They don't trust me to take down, but in my life, I have definitely taken down a system or two. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, and you still had a job, right? I, it right? turns out. And I think the other piece, you know, is to actually give yourself, give your teams the time to fix the things that are causing incidents, uh, because there's nothing worse than like, you know, getting paged for the same issue every day, every week. Uh, you start fixing that, you're giving them time back. That's toil, right? That, that's disruption to their actual work. So the better you get at, you know, fixing that, you know, it's just this, that's, it's the same thing as my pyramid chart. It's a maturity yeah. piece. Over time, it will make you better. And especially I find once you introduce more automation, you really need this process to keep honing that maturity around the automation. Um, it's, it's not something that you just automate and then like walk away and you never touch it again, right? You have to constantly have this discipline of making it better and more refined. A hundred percent. Yeah. Great. You know, yeah, I saw a question. Did that actually, we, we had a question come in. Did that kind of answer that question about? Yeah, I think you both answered the question. It was really around how often you want to review those new cases and add them to your process. And I think you both did a wonderful job of answering that. <laughs> I don't think we have any other questions that have come in I know that I'm seeing. So I think we can give everyone a couple minutes of their day back, um, which I'm sure everyone would appreciate. Um, just one last call out folks to visit the handouts if you wanna review the slides later and just look at some of the goodness that both Julie and Paula were talking about. And then we also dropped the link to response.pageduty.com, that ops guide. We dropped the Amazon architecture, well architected and operational excellence pillars. So you can go review all of that on your own time. If you're working on your own incident response processes and you want just a lot of reading material to help you do that. Um, it's a lot of really great stuff. But I really want to just thank both of you, Julie and Paula, for this conversation today. I think it was really helpful for all of our attendees. And to all of our attendees, thank you so much for being here as well. Yeah, thanks, everyone. It was a great conversation. All right. Well, I'd also like to say thank you to Kat, Julie, and Paula for taking the time to join our discussion and sharing all of your expertise with us. A quick reminder, uh, today's session was recorded. Following this panel, you'll receive an email with a link to access the recording on demand. You can also find the recording on the DevOps website. Just go to devops.com slash webinars in the on-demand section where you will find this webinar waiting for you. Now on to the gift card winners that I promised you at the beginning of this. We will, you will be receiving an email shortly after this uh, webinar as well. Be sure to check your spam folder. Uh, they have been known to go in there from time to time. Uh, the four winners are going to be Norbert P, Diana M, Marcus G, and Sandra S. Um, Kat, Julie, Paula, do you guys have any final remarks before we sign off? Just, uh, I think, thanks, everyone. And, uh, you know, hope everyone has a great success on their future uh, incident improvement journey. Absolutely. Thank you for joining us. All right, and I'd like to thank AWS and PagerDuty for sponsoring today's webinar. I'd also like to thank each of you, our audience, for being with us for the entirety of today's program. Please take a moment uh, to fill out our post-webinar survey once we close out here, and we hope to see you on our upcoming TechStrong Learning web, uh, sessions. Thank you again. Have a great day, and I'm signing out. <laughs>